Welcome to the Deadly Addictions channel. Today I'm going to be talking about the Beverly Hills Cop franchise, particularly the first three movies in anticipation for the new movie Beverly Hills Cop 4, Axel F, I think it's called. So I saw a advertisement for the new Beverly Hills Cop movie and I purposely shut it down. I closed the window. I have the box set for Beverly Hills Cop, and I said, before I even see a trailer, before I even get into anything about the production or whatever, I want to watch the first three movies. There's so many times you hear, or it hasn't really happened to me, but you, you come back to a franchise after a long period of time, and the movie, for some people, ruins the original experience. Now, we could talk about Star Wars, maybe, in that case, but... That was my reaction to this. Like, I don't want to know anything about this new movie. If it's a straight to streaming, is it a theatrical release? I don't know anything about it. Except the reason why I said that is I think I saw an N on the advertisement, so that might be Netflix. But I don't know for sure, and I'm not going to hold it against what I think is a pretty solid franchise, a trilogy of movies that, upon watching again, how funny the first couple of ones are. And even the third one, not as bad as I remember. And maybe it's, you know, the first one comes out, what, 1984, I'm 13 years old, just ready for a teenage, you know, uh, type cop movie. And it won me over. It won a lot of people over. and was pretty popular. And um, I guess at the time you can call it a success. But one thing that, made me smile so much was the music i was so surprised that the music instilled in the movie which goes through all of them is so impactful to this franchise so kudos uh, just brilliant in that way now the first movie like i said came out in 1984 was directed by martin brest um the screenplay and uh, daniel petri Eddie Murphy, Judge Reinhold, John Ashton, who, um, the main stage really, except for the, uh, I think the third one, one of them wasn't in. But, looking back and getting to watch them again is a real treat. And, again, the third one is obviously the most flawed. But I think when you talk to people about just having fun at a movie, it was welcome. But is that the problem with me being, you know, 17 or however old I was when the third one came out, and it was a disappointment because I had waited three years, whatever. But now, watching them all three together, I was, it kind of just went by me as just a movie that just wasn't as good as the rest. So, I give a real thumbs up and praise for this franchise. The first one, its balance of comedy and seriousness especially with Eddie Murphy's you know, rise to fame, was excellent. The plot was pretty decent. Um, you know, again, the high-speed chase, which didn't become a super staple of the series, but because of its impact with the music, just is something that is... Um, it was so impactful to watch again. It's hard to explain in that sense. You know, it's nostalgia. It's, it's, I haven't watched these movies in a long time. And, and you want to listen to a, you know, a wise-ass cop from Detroit, which just makes it all better. Um, and, and it's got the, uh, the tropes that actually work, because I don't think they were really tropes for my brain back then. But in the industry of, you know, television and movies, who knows? Uh, you know, he finds out his... Um, his childhood friend is um, in his house, and he's got uh, something going on. You know, it's one of those things that you piece together. You know, he, he's a shady guy, but he's trying to do good. But he's got himself in uh, at a security guard in Beverly Hills. And I think it has a, yeah, bear, bear bonds, right? I think that was like a lethal weapon thing, too. Barrel bonds were like a big thing in the movies for some reason, and it was a way to like, you know, get money passed around or something. Anyway, I don't know what the fuck they are, but uh, you know what? You can actually, 
you know. Anyway, fucking Barabons, German Barabons. Because so now I'm thinking of Lethal Weapon again. And I got to watch those too. But I did a podcast on those. I didn't do a podcast yet on my, you know, my opinions on the Beverly Hills Cop movies. Um, okay, so he won't be allowed by his, uh, you know, his captain or whatever to, ins- to go investigate. Because Mike dies, the guy who comes to his house with the Barabons. A friend that, you know, comes out of nowhere from, you know, childhood, and he won't let him, so the whole movie's premise is Axel Foley decides to take vacation, and he goes to Beverly Hills to solve the crime by himself. It's fucking genius when you watch it again, just the way it, it plays out, and Eddie Murphy at this time was just just on top of everything. Like, I, I can't attest to some of his latest movies, I haven't even watched the Coming to America 2, but it was just a, uh, you know, it just became too blasé with some of his movies, and I'm, I'm all, I'm fine with it. He's got his own career, he's an amazing comedian, rise to fame, if he wants to do kid movies and, you know, have his kids sit on his lap and be proud of his work, then he succeeded, he's amazing. I'm not putting any of those movies on. I just didn't have the passion or the interest to watch them. So, here goes the beginning of this franchise where Axl Rose goes to Beverly Hills Cop, the police station, and he just gets into trouble from the beginning, and he's wise-ass. And his growing friendship with um, a detectives, I think it's uh, John Taggart and Billy Rosewood, is classic and has endured the test of time i'm so excited to see the new one to see if they're in it they're fucking old and i can't well judge reinhold looked pretty young it's the other one yeah yeah it's uh tag i don't know if he's even here anymore but this buddy cop friendship is so awesome but to see it from axel foes is wise ass i'm trying to investigate this murder of an of a old friend to, I got to fit in and, and you know, I got to toe the line in, in, in Beverly Hills because I'm on vacation and the cops here are watching me, they're tailing him. He's never signed to watch him. And um, he starts getting into it. And you got some cameos here that really went into um, the sequels and stuff. Uh, I think his name is Bronchin Pinchaw or whatever. Right, is that how you say it? <laughs> and, um... Uh, the side cast, everything here works, the fucking villain. But as he's investigating, it's just like a, almost a calamity after calamity. But it's that type of movie where it shows you that a Detroit cop, he, he, he cuts to the chase and his common sense wins over rather than this Beverly Hills follow the book type thing. And w- growing up... It, it's almost akin to, in my reality of just, you know, being born in New York, but having somewhat traveled, but not like a, you know overseas maniac. In any case, it's that feeling that New Yorkers have and people from these, the tri-state area or main areas that people from the South and other areas of the country, which is not as congested, they're easily susceptible to certain things that are preyed upon in, let's say, New York or whatever that, that the the instincts and common sense of living in a, in a certain environment, such breeding skills and instincts and things that let you avoid or be wary of the predators in life. So it's, it's just that, that type of thing. And I think back in the day, it really was personified in a movie like this. The Axl Rose, you know, from Detroit, is going to get shit done. And it's going to be, well, part of the beauty is it's just Eddie Murphy, how good he is in a part like this, which is why his 48 Hours movie was probably one of my favorites. Um, that it comes off pretty good. And then the chemistry between them, it works right off the bat, and I didn't think it would. And going back again, it's the first movie, 1984. Again, you got classic villains. You got the girl who you know tries to help him, and the cops are slowly, you know, getting on his, um, you know, getting on his side throughout it, you know. Um, 
it, it just culminates in a in a pretty good scene that doesn't feel too watered down. And the reason why I bring that up is I think by the third movie, the formula that they worked on just didn't hold up as well. But again, watching the three of them together, I didn't watch the third movie in. Now, maybe it's the stigma that comes along with the movie throughout the ages, but again, the first movie, the plot, it, it just, again, even watching it again, like I said, it was, it's pretty straightforward. You know, Axel Rowe, he's a cop in Detroit, you know, under, uh, what is it? undercover, plain clothes type cop, you know, street smarts, that thing, and a friend comes out of nowhere, he dies, he goes to investigate, he makes movies going on vacation, and calamity, and you know, the shenanigans start, and it's just awesome from beginning to end. I can't really think of a really bad part of the movie because, again, at this point, Eddie Murphy was so good at just playing deadpan humor and outrageousness when, when he needed to. But th there's an underlying serious cop there once in a while, and I was surprised at how much I liked it and what a balance it bring to the movies. And I think that's... You know, what technically gets into the second movie, which I'll get into now. Um, well, anyway, you got the first movie. It, it culminates at the end. Um, they got to rescue Jenny. They fucking, you know, it's like a assault on a, an estate type thing. It's pretty sick. And it's Beverly Hills. So that's part of the charm here. It's like, you know, what we think about people in Hollywood and Beverly Hills and the police department. But... In the growing with these two cop partners, he actually grows with the captain of that department, which, you know, it's all about gaining respect and understanding where they sit in it, in this, you know, world that they occupy. Uh, so in 1987, Beverly Hills Cop 2, directed by Tony Scott, which I think if you look at the first one, he went on to do some insane stuff like a Top Gun and, um... So, I don't know who the first one, like, if you ask, like, who was it I said? Uh, Martin Brest. Like, I don't know what um, he did, to be honest. Uh, I think he did Midnight Run, which, if I'm correct, that, that's a Robert De Niro movie, which is fucking great. Anyway, so Beverly Hills Cop, 1987. Watching it again, I, I, I thoroughly enjoyed this movie. It's two years after the first film. Um, there's some changes and you know, and it's also that like what changes does Axel Foley make and not only the growth of the characters that uh, become his friends, uh, Billy and Taggart or Rosewood and Taggart, but how they change in the movie. And I thought it was adorable in a sense. It's just Judge, Re Judge Reinhold has that way of being, you know, so innocent, but trying to be a serious cop and Taggart's just like that old guy on the force. It works so well. But it's that growth you see that is charming to watch. Um, you got like people in here, like Brigitte Niels is in this. Of course, Jurgen Prancha was back. Um, Paul Reiser. But in this one, it's more of Axel's doing his thing in Detroit, and um, I think it's the captain. I don't know if they changed um, rankings. Like, was he the captain in the first one? He was the chief of police. Like, I don't know. But I think his name is Bogmill. Uh, Bogomil. Um, and he gets, gun he gets shot. I don't know what to do with like an alphabet letter thing. So, Beverly Hills. He's got to go. Axel, now knowing about this, goes to Beverly Hills. Starts investigating, you know, jewelry heist and what you know all about the fucking whole plot of the movie and as he starts finding clues he's got to interact with <laughs> these guys again uh rosewood and taggart again just sh seeing how this relationship grew but there's still some animosity and some hard feelings here and there and it comes through well i don't know you could see maybe like behind the scenes shit like where they do pranks on each other or something but in all the pictures you see, they just look like they're just so grateful to be part of something like this. And I think it shows in these movies. Again, this movie is continuing two years after. It's a new investigation. The uh, chief, of, chief of police or the captain, 
who they started to admire and really follow. And again, there were changes in the, um, you know, the hierarchy of the police. So Rosewood, you know, been tagged of maybe different sections or ones higher ranking, you know, and they, they pay attention to those type of things. But again, the fun and the calamity and the shenanigans ensue. And again, the music, everything's tying this movie together. You're going to have fun. Yes, I think the first one is still the best, but this one holds up. Um, you know, I understand what people say, like Jaws 2, the second Jaws. You know, it's kind of ridiculous, but I love it. I think that's like this. like It's good enough that all the nitpicks and stuff get bypassed. And I think this one does that too. And although the the formula here and finding things out and how Axel interacts with them is a little bit different, but but again, by the third movie, it just you know it gets it. I think he as you start seeing it, and then, you know they got to deal with the fucking weapons dealer. They're buying weapons, and again, I know the second, the third movies where. Holly World or whatever the fuck becomes, you know, the main thing. But a, a lot of these, the first two movies had some great settings, some real feel to them in the sense where Detroit is Detroit and Axel's doing his thing, his attitude and how, you know, odd it is to see him come get out of a taxi in Beverly Hills. And as great as it is in remembering i think it's by the third one is where it really just loses a little steam but again uh the second one 1987 so it really came out three years after uh tony scott a great director in that sense from when you compare him and what he's done with it oh okay so it's that that's right so it's at the end of the movie when you know they solve everything and they're gonna fucking convince the mayor of shit um, uh, Bogomil is becomes the new chief police chief. Um, and then you know, and then he chews him out on the phone because he calls his chief, and that's a great thing because he has a awesome relationship with his uh his captain from Detroit because he uh, he thanks him. <laughs> it's just uh, it, it, again, there's there's a cuteness, there's a charm. To these movies that held up in the second one for me, even at the end, you know, and Bogomil, because you don't really want to like Bogomil from the first movie either. You know what a prick he was, but where they, you know, the movie is showing the differences in uh, how police act in Detroit, and it's almost that same thing about New York. You get that stereotype, and how it blossoms and it becomes, you know, something that the third movie kind of failed at. In my opinion. Okay, so the third movie comes out in 1994. It's directed by John Landis, which you would think, I mean, this guy's done everything. The National Lampoon, uh, the Blues Brothers, right? Animal House. He's a American Whale from London, one of my favorite movies, Trading Places. This guy's epic. And he's on a, you know, he's, a, he's on a tier that most directors won't get into. However, the third movie is where it kind of, you know, it just doesn't work as well. The setup is pretty good, and the, again, the music carries through, so you're really on everything, and you're feeling the vibe. But I would say it's the second act, like, as soon as the first act kind of propels you into the movie, it just doesn't feel... Like it took advantage of all the things that were happening and where they decided to focus on, um, you know, it's one of those things where they tell you, oh, we can't get the killer because the Secret Service needs him alive. Um, it's just a Wonder World theme park, and I think it's. I don't know, because it, whenever, all right, before I watched it again, every time I think of this third movie, I think of your uh, vacation, the vacation movies from John Landis, right? I think that's from John Landis, so National Lampoon. 
So is it that this movie's not that bad, but its setting, its main theme of linking Wonder World, a theme park, it just, I don't know, it, it, it played to too many low, you know, low-hanging fruit maybe type stuff. Uh, but there's a good... Now you're missing one of the cops in this one, the Taggart, I believe. Um, but again, they put Bronch and Pintrode in here, and he became a staple. Uh, I'm wondering if he comes back in the fourth one. But I think this is just a weaker installment, but it's... I don't know if it's terribly bad. Am I just smiling because I love the first two, and this one is like, oh... Um, we're just gonna milk it, the franchise, but it doesn't seem that way to me watching it again. I think that was maybe the perception and the, the, the feelings I carried with the movie over the years. Again, this just came out in, what, 94. So even then, I'm 23, and it's, um, you know, it's a weird time in my life or whatever. It didn't measure up. But even if I wanted to put my critics hat on and be straight laced about it yeah i wouldn't go into a debate with people or try to you know argue that this movie is a great movie or that it was better than the other two however there are things in the movie that kind of feel like elevating with judge reinhold and again it could be just uh they have such wonderful chemistry and you know who's writing the fucking movie and i don't know it just doesn't hold up as well. Again, you're running around this uh, amusement park. And it just, um, uh, I don't know. It just doesn't hold the weight. It just feels a little watered down. And, you know, but again, not as bad as I thought I remembered it. It's so weird how you, you know, it's, this is a, an example of a trilogy uh, franchise that kind of ended with the third one. And when you think about them in, the, in, in a different way, I think they hold up as a trilogy. Again, I will admit the third one is the weaker one, but it didn't really it didn't offend me. And I think that's one of the things you kind of get when you go online, because these three, obviously, I did do my fucking little wiki things and you know and then they say the third movie was like the second one was not critically acclaimed but it was a success financially i think they deemed the third one as a failure because it wasn't critically acclaimed and it wasn't a box office um success but i don't think it hurts the franchise in a major way i don't think by watching the third one it you know but some people are different i get it you know I, I definitely get it. I wouldn't want to, you know. But, again, it's it's also like that with books. Like, I I, I know the, the mindset of, look, I don't want someone to take a chance on adapting this book that I love because it won't happen again, and it's, they, they won't take another chance. I get that, and I actually favor that in a way, which what they did with the Sword of Shannara, giving it to MTV, and just fucking, just was, was garbage in a sense. But... It won't ruin the book for me. The Hobbit movies, well, okay, so Lord of the Rings trilogy, amazing, maybe the best trilogy ever. I really enjoy and like the Hobbit movies, uh, the prequels. And yes, they stretched out everything, they made it you know, somewhat ridiculous, but I still enjoy them. It won't ruin the Hobbit book, it won't ruin the Lord of the Rings movies for me. I don't look back to them and, you know, hold my nose like it's it doesn't impact me but I, I do think it's a human thing that it does for certain people so so open up the box that we watch one and two and i can see people going oh, i don't want to watch three i found myself enjoying it for what it was worth that it was part of the trilogy and i enjoyed seeing it again going back in time trying to use this fucking pothead memory I think I carried around a negative feeling for the third movie for a long time. Like, I can't remember when I 
watch the Beverly Hills Cop movies. I think I did with a couple of friends on like an odd night or whatever. But that, got, that could be you know, 15, 20 years ago. I don't know. In any case, I'm revisiting the Beverly Hills Cop movies in anticipation for the fourth one that's coming out. That's probably out now. I don't know anything about it at all. Except I think my brain's working with the N in the corner like it was a Netflix release. But in for this in this I'll probably do that soon too because my extra work is slowed down, so I'm not as bogged down in a lot of work and you know, being tired and in pain all the fucking time. But I look back at these movies, Beverly Hills Cop One, amazing movie, kind of a breakthrough movie, and really showcases um, the talent elevating the you know the source the, the material they have and I think it's clear because I think that elevation is what makes the third one not so good that you can't keep doing that you can't keep you know the formula wasn't reinvented there wasn't a new aspect that really brought out something in the character that made you remember the movie the, the, the third one just keeps remem- reminding me of vacation movies with Wally World or whatever and maybe that was its intent but again when I, wa- when I got to the second movie and I watched it I, my smile never faded I, I felt like I got carried through the whole movie without thinking too much about the, the well what I'm doing is I'm getting if I'm gonna prepare for something like this obviously I'm gonna keep some make some notes about certain thoughts uh, you know the from the classic jacket being used and carried on to the first movie where he's, if you see on my thumbnail, he's on a car, a hood of a car with a, a hoodie, a sweater. Uh, and, and keeping that contrast between Beverly Hills and Detroit kind of just blurred in the third one for me. It just, I get you putting the Detroit cop in Beverly Hills and you've got that situation, but Something new would have had to happen in the third one, and I'm not sure where they would go with the fourth one. Are they going to make the fourth one 20 years after? Like, okay, so let's let's say these are in real time life, whatever. Okay, so in 1994 is the last time Axl Rose had an adventure. Now we know when the movie came out in '84, and let's say it's placed around that time. So by the time the second one comes out two years later, three years have passed in the movie. Fine. It, it, it still fits. You don't have to do too much breaking your brain mad. And then the second, the third one is 94. 2004, 2014. So it's 30 years later. So even if Axel Foley was a cop when he was 18 years old, it's... It still marks, well, he looks amazing, by the way, in, in any pictures you see him, whether it's glossy, filtered up or not. So, he's got the agelessness, but he's fucking old. What are you going to, you can't have him punching people, getting thrown through windows, right? I mean, I guess you could try, because Arnold, like, tries to do it still somewhat. Although, you probably get some great stunt actors. So I am curious, and that's why I'm I'm doing this. I haven't done this on the podcast. Um, again, Beverly Hills Cop franchise has been one of those treasures for me. Um, and trying to think back, though, I I think I have to be honest and say like the third one. I think this happened when we did me and my friend did the uh, James Bond. He had a box at like fucking 17 James Bond movies in it or something. And we went through it. And again, it happened again at a certain point in life because the box set was kind of wasn't caught up no more because more movies had come out. And there were certain ones that I didn't, I wasn't anticipating watching and it kind of um, almost spoiled the mood for it. Even if it wasn't the James Bond I like, or you know the way the themes work. Some of the Roger Moore's are more comedy-driven and funny, and you know when you karate chop someone in the neck, 
<laughs> yeah, people would just get fucking knocked out. But with the with the Beverly Hills Cop movie, I was surprised that the third one was a pleasant anticipation. Yes, the ride wasn't as good. It wasn't as uh, captivating. The formula's a little watered down in that distinction with um, what makes him a Detroit cop and what makes them, you know, California cop. It just didn't feel new and and um, inspiring in the sense where the first two were just. Um, it just uh, it didn't feel like it really held up to the other ones. But again, I'm going to admit that I don't. I think I had a real negative experience just because of life shit, maybe. Um, like, at the time, like, yeah, I get the amusement park type thing, but, you know, it just didn't have the, uh, like, you know, it just didn't have that impact it had for me. But, again, I just think of it as a, um... Uh, a slight departure, but it still holds true. Most of the things you read about it is, um, it's not something they, they, they wanted to do. They didn't need the money. It's not going to break any new ground. This is like one of the little blurbs, like on whatever. Uh, you know. I guess it is a bank thing, so... You know, because I'm trying to glance at it now, uh, again, maybe there were things I read or knew back in the day that held a negative, you know, resonance with the movie, but as I'm doing here, ready to finish this podcast, I was surprised how much I kind of liked the third one. I mean, it didn't have, you know, all the charm of the first two. It, again, just like Eddie Murphy said, you know, you're going to break new ground, you're just going for bank. Maybe that's sort of the impact, but looking at it now, I don't think it ruins the franchise. I don't think it lowers the value of the other movies. However, that's never been a part of who I am. It's never been, like I, like I described earlier, it's never been something that impacted me long term. Now, Star Wars has gotten close, but, but it doesn't mean it ruins my experience of the original movies or any of the books I read, because they made like the legacy books. The, the books that came out, they're not canon no more. It's a whole fucking thing. And the Star Wars nerdverse. Don't get fucking involved. You'll get like swarmed. In any case, the um, the feeling here is a general joy. And I got through the three movies smiling and feeling that nostalgia. The quality drops. But again, the first two in that equal territory except for the first one's a little more magic but it's funny seeing the second one you know repeat some of the same mistakes and i think the third one you know just didn't hit the numbers didn't hit the marks and maybe it had to do with going into the movie with a certain mind frame like they did and i don't see a real hatred for the movie like i don't think it's super legit but Again, I've said stupid things like, I love the Green Lantern movie. I know it's not good. Uh, I just did a, someone wrote a comment, someone left a comment on my movie, my review for um, the new Omen, the first Omen. And it was like, um, this movie is bad, just like every new horror movie. And I was like, I responded with, you know, I've been known to like a bad movie because I really enjoyed the first Omen. So yeah, I get it. I tolerate things that slip by me as my critic hat on and a we checking off boxes that are going to make this a, you know, a, a three on a fucking scale of ten. I don't know. But if I'm just going through my head, love the first one, love the second one, and I enjoyed the third one on this watch around. And I think that's the culmination of this video. The, the impact of the, the, the relationships really worked, they grew, you felt real camaraderie and growth, even with the captain, like I said, you're going to miss them, and the third one just, you know, just feels a little more watered down and not as vibrant and, you know, 
stunning in a way where the first two did. Uh, and again, Eddie Murphy is at the peak of his career here, maybe about a third one. Even when I looked at the wiki and it says, you know, his thoughts on it, he's like, you know, I didn't need the money. Why are we doing it? Because they're in, they're in development already. Uh, you know, I don't know. Well, again, as I'm trying to go through looking at this wiki with my notes, is uh, three movies is a little, uh, was a lot more to bite off. I just wanted to do a general thing about it. But I'm going to admit to being curious of why so many people don't like the third one or talk bad about it and realizing that I'm one of them. Like, I think I was one of them. And it's a little weird to say that on this podcast. I don't know why, but thinking back, Beverly Hills Cop 1 and 2, I probably wouldn't have given good remarks or had a good facial expression. I don't think I would have showed any sort of joy in like watching it again or something. But I see, I do remember having fun. I see, again, it's friends and it's the experience. But now I'm watching it. All three, you know, with a with a little pad next to me, kind of is a different experience, rather than like uh, more like when I watched the first Omen, I was ready for horror and I didn't put myself in that position. This was one of those. Oh wow, I'm going to watch the the new Beverly Hills Cop Four, Axel F, and why don't I do put my thoughts on the first three movies and do a quick podcast and get that out beforehand. So that's what this is, and again. Um, I love the franchise, uh, love the first two, I admit to not being so enthusiastic about the third one, but pleasantly surprised that I didn't hate it, it didn't offend me as much as I, my brain told me it would, <laughs> and I guess that's the beauty of this, you know, time, mindset, who we are, you know, this is so, this is such a lens to look at, again, Billy Hills Cop, 1984, I'm 13 years old. Around 13 years old. I'm born in 71. This was the shit to watch. It was fucking awesome. I told a story one time. Like, when you were 13 in, in 1984, you're not looking in newspapers. I, tell, I think I told this story on one of my podcasts. I'm walking through the street one day, and a friend comes up to me and goes, Have you seen Lethal Weapon? I go, No, what the fuck is that? And he goes, Oh, you got to go see it. Didn't say nothing else. I decided to see it, and what a milestone, what a breakthrough type movie for me as a young, growing man. This is the same thing, and I am a little surprised at myself of thinking of the third one so negatively, or just have I changed? Um, is it, you know, I know it's a lot of work to do, but maybe I'll just go and do my own little thing on do a little deep dive on the third one, but again, the Beverly Hills Cop franchise, I love it. I don't think the third one ruins it, but I am aware that it's not as strong, it's not as good. It doesn't feel vibrant and pop enough for me and, you know, get me in that movie, but the fucking music in all three movies had got me. I, I made a note to see how much it pulled me back and gave me good feelings and and nostalgia is a powerful thing. And the third one, not so good in a sense, but w do I look back and look at a, move, a franchise I just and recommend it? Without a doubt, if there was people younger than me or whatever, say, oh, I've never watched those movies. I think you got to watch them. Watching Eddie Murphy come into his own in a character like this is um, something I think people who are interested in, obviously, should see. Um, his transformation, like, and you look at uh, 48 Hours and some of the movies he did in this era. He, he, he was captivating in that sense. And let's not talk about his fucking comedy routines, which would be, like, censored today. All right, anyway. Beverly Hills Cop, one, two, three. I love the trilogy. I'm aware that the third one isn't as good, but it didn't impact me like I thought it would. And that's my recommendation for this. It's a 
real fun. I was, and again, I was surprised at how funny the first one one is. And you know, I guess the, the same setups and this type of stuff. Not exact, but you know, kind of ruin it. But wow, funny as shit. The music is on point. You know, it's got some great action and stunts in it here and there. Give Beverly Hills Cop a fucking rewatch if you haven't watched it in a while. Let me know how you think the third one goes. In any case, this is it for me. I'll be doing a podcast on the next one, Beverly Hills Cop 4, so that should be out soon. I don't know if I'm going to... I'll, I'll wait at least a week, so it'll probably be next Sunday, if, if, unless fucking more work comes up. But anyway, have a great day. My best to you and yours. Till next time.